And here we are. It is day three of the 2024 Collegiate National Table Tennis Championships. We are in the round of 64 men's singles opening up the last and final day. I'm Joe Wells. Alongside me is Matt Hetherington. Matt, we are in for the treat of the, of the weekend, really. Singles, men's, yep. women's. This is where some of the athletes have come. They've, they've been here all weekend. They, maybe they didn't have a team or a a doubles partner to participate in any of the events with. So this is going to be their shining moment. On table number one, we have Santiago Acosta of NJIT and Nicholas Yamain of Texas Wesleyan University. Uh, we didn't get to see much of uh, Nicholas in the co-ed event. But, yeah, uh, Santiago is only playing singles. So he's one of those players that you just talked about where doesn't have a team, not in the doubles. So... This is, this is it. This is crunch time for him. It's one match, make or break. And it's one of those things where, you know, you're here from Thursday to today and you're just seeing all of this great table tennis being played. And I'm sure he's been itching to get out on the table and just really get after it. So he's the first matchup of the day. So hopefully all of that, that pent up energy that he's had uh, will come out here firing early. We run all the singles today. It's the last day of competition here at Wisconsin Eau Claire. So round of 64 all the way through to championship matches later on, say late afternoon. Yeah, we had uh, some great uh, co-ed finals yesterday, especially on the men's side. It was a lot of fireworks with uh, Texas Wesleyan defeating UC Berkeley in the finals. The heavily anticipated one versus two lineup, but here we are, round of 64 singles underway. And already Santiago Acosta showing some very quick hands where he Opens up with uh, looks like was going to be push and disguises it with a quick flip. Go. 
Yeah, Santiago is a very high energy player. Really goes after every ball. Nicholas Yamane is part of the winning Wesleyan team. Yeah, that Wesleyan team is just really deep. I imagine that uh, Yamane yeah, might have played in the earlier rounds to get his team to that final. Nicholas Acosta looks like early going, Matt, that he wants to try uh, to get these points going, uh, establishing balls long and getting into the, the quick rally. So you saw several long serves straight into the backhand corner of Yamin. Yeah, Santiago, I'd say his playing style is very fast paced. So we do see a lot of long serves. A lot of quick follow-ups. But he also has a good defensive game as well. And that was a, a great example of it where he was transitioned very well from defense to offense with a big counter at the end of that point on the forehand side. Couple of net clips there. And Yamane is receiving a lot of the service long. I think more short play might be in order for him. Of course, Acosta's gonna make that difficult by serving a lot of half long. Oh, and Acosta's still going after it. He Basically, he might be one of those people that's never seen a ball he can't hit. Great body placement there from Yamane. Yeah, and Acosta let that one get a little bit away from him, and he pays for it as Yamane, I mean, uh, Acosta puts a big forehand <laughs> inside out. See Acosta really going for these counters. So Yamane, everything that he plays, if it's soft or slightly high, it's going to get potentially dealt to. And that's just one of those serves that you definitely want back. Yamane is starting to put things together here. Just like that, Yamane reels off three state straight points. He leads 9 7 in game one. getting caught out in the short game. And very smart by Yamane wanting to elect to, to stay with the uh, short serve, open up with pushes. And Yamane closes out game number one with an inside out forehand, 11-8. Matt, you've played in the collegiate divisions before, but you've always had the pleasure of coming with a team, and we'll probably make reference to it at some point later in the afternoon. But uh, Acosta here with nobody in the, in the corner. And I, I want to say yesterday, two days ago, we, we talked about a little bit about some players being heavily dependent on 
mm. players having coaches in their corner and, and not really being able to um, play at their, their peak without a coach in their corner. Just something about having that extra layer of support and comfort. And Acosta is here by himself, kind of just, you know, toweling off on his own. Yeah, I mean, he's relatively mature player, so um, I think background-wise, uh, he's kind of developed his game without a coach anyway. Um, so he doesn't have that reliance. I mean, I'm sure Yamane is fine without one as well, um, but certainly, yeah, as you said, when you're in a, a, a big hall and you don't have a team on the bench and nobody on the sideline for you. Um, it can be a little tough, but there are certainly players who have that independence. And I guess we'll see if he, if he can figure things out. Yeah, it calls to like many of the uh, individual athletes that, that come. Uh, it's very well the same situation when they're back in their, their city or, or region that they play in. Um, because they don't have a team, they're, they're very well the only athlete uh, competing in a lot of our uh, regional events. I think the things that worked for Yamane in the first were keeping the ball short, getting the first attack in with spin to the backhand. I feel like Acosta played pretty passively on the first block, and then Yamane was able to follow up pretty strong, especially changing the placement. You can see there catching that wide angle to the backhand. Certainly that reverse serve has done him a lot of favors. And there, Acosta right back to what uh, got him some early points in game number one is he elects to give him a long spinning serve, getting that first ball up, and uh, they don't call it the third ball attack for nothing. For all of you that are new to the game, they're watching, their athletes are allowed towel break every six points. It's very smart. It's almost like a, a mini timeout, if you will. Costa just picks up the half long ball. Pretty close to the table edge there. Hear Acosta there, kind of talking to himself uh, as the uh, net mic picked uh, up that miscue on the return, where he elected to open up uh, a backhand played wide, and Yamane plays a forehand real loose, and he is now facing a game point. Sergio Acosta up 10-5, game number two. Clips the net to finish things. 11-5 for Acosta. Some great adjustments from him. Yamane played a, a real loose game. He really, uh, I don't want to say straight away from what got him the, the first game, but it uh, looks like um, Yamane was just much more comfortable um, with knowing that the short was going to come first. Yeah. Being patient on the first ball, but still going right back to where he wants to do, and that's getting that ball uh, up and deep and attacking. I think uh, Yamane played a lot of his attacks pretty loose. I don't think he connected on very many of them. Bruno Ventura there on the bench. Uh, Texas Wesleyan alum and now helping them here. Many years coaching in the Houston area building up junior programs there. Now he 
resides in Maryland, mm. helping juniors uh, in the Maryland community, but just a, a great energy, great person to have on your bench. If, if I was a player, you know, he's definitely somebody I'd want in my corner. serves into the crossover from Acosta. Two points on the board. Not the start that Nicolas Yamane wants. Yeah, and you can see here Santiago Acosta feeling real good in, in game number three as he's going after it. He was able to get a few cheap points from Yamane, dumping the returns into the net, but there's that good Good setup from Yamane. Short play allows Acosta to be the player that plays long. Spins the first ball in. An unfortunate net ball there. And it really can change the, the spin of the ball. It uh, takes some spin off of it, or it could even project what people call a dead ball, which is uh, literally no rotation on the ball. <laughs> Matt, explain to the people what just happened there, because Clearly someone thought that the point was over and then there was a hand up and the point was still going and uh Yeah. Yeah, well the ball hit the net. I think maybe Acosta thought the ball was close to bouncing twice before Yamane actually managed to get it back, so kind of partially raised the hand in apology, but then continued the rally. And that's one of those things they teach a lot of people, particularly young people. The point isn't over until the ball drops. So keep playing the point over until it's, until it's all the way over. Exchange there, Santiago Acosta. Great recover out the forehand. Yamane had played a really good uh, forehand straight to the body, but Acosta was able to make an adjustment. there from Imani, but Acosta gets the job done with the inside out forehand to finish. Quick hands by both players, I should say. Well, speaking of which, Acosta ties things up, seven points each. No. One thing noted here in these early rounds of singles, you're going to see a lot of players that are rated very closely together. And this one is no different. This is one of the closest round of 64 matches on paper, that's for sure. Here we have here, and this is this talks about the depth of the men's field. We have two players that are 2,300, and one seated 18th, the other one seated 26, and they're only separated by roughly 30 points in rating. Costa just beams that ball down the line. Yamane probably regretting stepping around and heading the ball right into Acosta's backhand. And Acosta just, at this stage of the game, you just can't afford to play 
those really loose returns. The ball just really getting away from him there. And it's almost like he's still not anticipating knowing that Acosta wants to get the ball long to him. Again, we go to the towel break. We are in one game apiece, 9-9 nine, nine in the third. Pivotal third, if you will. And Yamane yeah, just great placement there at the elbow of Santiago Acosta. And gets in that pocket again to close out game three. Yeah, great job by Yamane there as he takes two big forehands to end that game right into the body of Acosta. It's something that he gave him earlier in the game as well. Just another big, big forehand to the body, as you mentioned, playing to the elbow. But I also think when you look at the way this game has kind of played out a little bit, he doesn't want to allow Acosta to use any kind of wingspan or reach and, yeah. and uh, really get in on the exchange. So he keeps him honest by jamming him up, keeping the ball in the middle, maybe making uh, Acosta block a little bit more. But he was able to actually visit Eau Claire, Hong Space, Bluestone Designs and Creations, United States Coast Guard, and NCTTA and all their wonderful volunteers and staff that make this event possible. 2024 event here in beautiful Eau Claire couldn't be possible. Lucas and his team here have just done an amazing job of hosting us. Starting to pick up that uh, serve setup from the reverse pendulum. I think I think Yamani's just figured out just ease into the rally. If he can place the first spinny ball well, like you could see there, Santiago not really committed to stepping around and making a big attack. can just see you can see Yamane he's just playing a slow steady opening but he's looking for that pocket that elbow transition where Santiago switches from backhand to forehand and I think right now Acosta needs to call timeout he needs to break this very quick I mean he's already dug a hole at 5-0 he trails 2-1 here you would hate to see a young man be here travel all this way for four days and it's a one match and done, but that's what, what it is here at College Nationals. That's the tough thing about playing singles. And the timeout comes at... I don't know if he signaled a timeout or not. No, just taking a towel break. 6-0 for Nicholas Yamane from Texas Wesleyan. I think Acosta really needs to string together at least a few points in a row here. Yamane really being clever about his pushing game here. You can see him just look at them even further back from the table, just dropping it half long. Absolutely. Acosta's going to have to string together points like now, and you hate to feel like you're rushed, that you have to get, you know, point after point after point just to get back in the match. But that's exactly what he's going to have to do. It's a great return there down the line, getting uh, Yamane stretched out wide on the forehand. If he can get a few cheap points here on serve, serve, return, I think he'll settle him down a little bit. Smart timeout call there by the corner of Texas Wesleyan.
So, Nicolas Simone, 7-3 in the lead. Santiago Acosta with the serve. Definitely had the opportunity there. I think one of the things that's probably affected Acosta the most is that he wants to play long. You know, he, when you want to play that fast and loose game, it's really hard to bring things back and try and shorten things up. You can see there the serve return. It's, it's pretty loose. He got away with it there, but... <coughs> but I also noticed that in this game, unlike many others, this is the first game that I've seen Acosta initiate uh, the offense first and early. Mm. Uh, electing to go, you know, long, deep top spins, not push returns, or just soft opening flips, uh, which is also a sign of confidence. That he's feeling a little bit about better about where he is in his game. And there, Yamane, just a uh, big backhand. He sails long. Other way around. <laughs> Nicholas Yamane, 3 1. Texas Wesleyan wins the match. Uh, really. Just a steady performance, I think, from Yamane, and he kind of just leveled out across the match. I think in the end, he he managed to knuckle down and keep the ball short, but we saw on a lot of occasions when Yamane was playing short, Santiago was usually returning long off the short ball, probably could have redropped um, and tried to keep the sequence short, maybe flipped a little bit more, but I think in the end... Maybe a few too many long pushes from him. And once Yamane got in and started attacking with good placement on that first opening ball, a lot of the time into the elbow or across the middle, really made a big difference for him. So Texas Wesleyan's hopes of winning the men's singles championship alive and well with Nicolas Yamane advancing into the round of 32. Yeah, and Texas Wesleyan just so much talent and depth on their roster. We'll have another Texas Wesleyan pairing as we'll see the number 17 seed Alexander Wu. No oh, correction. Looks like they're going to uh, lean into women's action here on table number two. We're going to take Looks a quick like break <laughs> and be right back with you. All right, so we do have a women's singles round of 64 match here between 
Sophie Wu from MIT on the far side, and Sophia Sapanovic from Texas Wesleyan. Sapanovic was part of the winning women's team event. Let's just say the winning team it took gold last night in the women's team event. She had the honor of being here on table number one to win the decisive match that handed them the gold. And uh, Matt, it should be a very tightly contested one as Stefanovic's 26th seed, Sophie Wu of MIT, the 22nd seed. Well, we'll see how Stefanovic handles the slightly all-round defensive play from Wu. We had the pleasure of seeing them both play yesterday uh, in the co-ed division. You know that MIT is uh, consistently qualifying for nationals each year. And the past few years, a lot of that has been coming from the play of Sophie Wu as she's just an all-out uh, grinder on the table, not necessarily a modern-day defender. Um, but you will see a lot of uh, heavy chop and push from her. And here we are, round of 32 women's singles. That's oh, round of 32. There was me saying round of 64. Good old Sunday mornings. <laughs> Sepanovic just puts that chop on notice. She looks fairly comfortable with the returning the chop. Well, it's one of those things where even having a women's program uh, at a place like Texas Wesleyan, you're just surrounded by so many great players and talent uh, that the practice level day in and day out is, is world class, really. And um, that's just one of those things that not a lot of teams can say that they, they have both a co-ed and women's team just full of great players that every day you can work on something. Um, and that's whether that's playing a defender like Sophie Wu or playing someone that's all out attack and super offensive on two winged attack if you will so yeah absolutely I'm sure that Sophia uh, comes into this match well prepared Great attacking combination there from Sepanovic. One of the things that I like so far from her game, and generally in the women's game, when you look at attack versus chop, a lot of the women's players will push prominently on their backhand. So they'll rely on their forehand to play topspin against the, the backspin from the chop, but Sepanovic looks really comfortable playing backhand loop, which is definitely going to give her a big advantage here in this match. The one thing I also noticed, Matt, is that the, the patience. You know, those couple of points she's put together already with a big lead here in game one, but she was really patient um, and not thinking or feeling really threatened uh, that Sophie Wu was going to attack or hit anything. Just sails that one long. I think we're definitely going to need to see Wu getting on the attack a little bit more. That ball, for example, 
probably would have been a good one to try and play forehand on. Let's see. Just sailed into the middle of the table. That would have been the perfect one to attack. Big backhand swing there from Stefanovic. And Stefanovic is just doing a really great job of even recognizing Sophie Wu twiddling on the uh, chop as she gets back off the table. A lot of times she's going to move uh, the red and the black side back and forth a number of times. This time Sophie Wu gets on the offensive. She needs to mix that in. I think if she plays defensively the majority of the time and kind of sticks to playing more traditional defense, then I think Sepanovic just has a really good rhythm for playing defense. Good top spin control. Great decision making. So first game, 11-6 for Sofia Sepanovic from Texas Wesleyan. Yeah, and you're absolutely right, right, Matt. I mean, even if she's not going to attack, she should at least give some control loop just deep on the table to keep Sepanovic honest when not just feeling like, hey, I've got all the time in the world to just play mm -hmm. a push, play a push, and wait on my ball. Um, she has the ability to loop on the forehand side, so she is able to mix that in a little bit more. I think even if she can get it on the return of serve mm -hmm. um, to start the point off that way, um, it at least keeps your po opponent honest and not getting them comfortable into a rhythm of just push, 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 and then wait for a ball that I can hit. Yeah. Yeah, and, and she's. I think she's just giving too much freedom of choice to Sepanovic where every ball's coming back some form of backspin and she can just pick and choose and so far I think her shot selection has been really strong of when she's chosen to drop the ball when she's chosen the loop that's a better play from Sophie Wu gets back on the counter attack Just mis misplayed that ball there by Stefanovic. loose points here in game number two and Sophie Wu is off to a great start. She's almost coming to join us in the commentary booth there. I think next year Matt we're going to work on uh, recruiting some ball boys and girls, ball kids. <laughs> oh. Just a little late. You can see the ball Dropped slightly from top of the bounce. Much harder to control at that point. But I think Wu's done a really good job of starting to disrupt things a little. Sometimes it only takes a, a really small break in confidence to kind of, you know, so, I mean, here's a good example. If you're playing somebody who's chopping or somebody who's lobbing, you can feel really confident, always be in great position, always contacting the ball really well. But then the, your opponent can kind of just sneak in, you know, if you miss a lob or if you don't move your, foot, uh, your feet perfectly, you just get these little twinges of doubt, I guess, that start to affect your confidence. Stuff like that, you know, like that's, that's the perfect example. That, that's going to weigh on her, you know. That's an easy ball for her. Yeah, it looks like she just really didn't even make a, a good footwork effort there on that last forehand she dumped into the net. 
I yeah. also think that Sophie's found a little bit better range on yeah, the yeah. on the chop where she's not floating them as high. I mean, she's putting a whole lot more um, action on on the follow through, and uh, it's paying off well here in the second game. Yeah, and she's changing things up a lot as well, and you can see the effect of that. You go from a player in the first game who looked really, really comfortable and full control of the table and a couple of unforced errors here and there. Things really start to turn around. Yeah, and Sepinovic needs you know more of those type of shots and returns to get herself back into this game and get that confidence back. Really overheading a little bit here. Just an unlucky edge ball there as Sophie Wu was in control of that point and Stefanovic just sticks the paddle out and uh, gets a little player luck there. Looks like almost more of a frustration flip than anything, Matt. set it up well. It was a nice inside out forehand to get the ball wide. You could see her returning to that steadier, more patient approach. I think she, I feel like she won so clearly. She was such a standout winner in the first game that the second game came along. Sophie changed things up. Started mixing in a lot of different shot variations but also returned a lot more balls on the table and that's when you have to wake up and realize you have to put in the work to win these points you're not going to get easy points and sometimes you might have to hit 10 12 15 shots to win a rally um well that's what you have to do if you want to win the point but that's part of the strategy if you will for some people really at a, uh, even at a high level the goal might be to lull you into uh, a game that you really don't want to play. Um, when you play a defender, uh, again, we talked about how well she handled game number one by just being patient. But she uh, she just looked kind of disinterested on some of her offensive shots, and it showed when she played them loosely. I think she just has to be more confident in the, the top spin shots. You know, if you're, if you're trying to hit the ball flat and you're heading long or you're heading in the net, go back to playing topspin. You know, you can, play, you can play a stronger topspin ball, but right now I feel like she's kind of throwing too much into the ball. S needs to control things like the body weight transfer. You could see her whole body shifted forward into that shot. And that was a great, you know, talking about weight transfer. She definitely uh, followed Stable. through on that last forehand. Looked really, really comfortable. Sofia Sepinovic here now on top 3-1 in the third game. Again, just going for too much a little too early. 
She definitely set that ball up, but you can see the ball was still on the rise. Just a well-constructed point by both ladies where it was a, a great exchange back and forth, heavy push from Sophie Wu, great chop. Stefanovic did exactly what she was supposed to do, but that forehand just sailed a little long on her, but it was a great point, and I uh, feel like it, she has a chance to win more of those kind of rallies if she just sticks with, uh, with that game plan. I mean, at this point, it's really a mental game. I feel like the tactical part of it's there from both players. It's just about mental fortitude. Sophie Wu's a defender. Most defensive players, they just dig deep and find a way to get through things. So the pressure very much on the attacking player right now. That's a great and well-timed finish. And it all started with a really good backhand um, that she was able to initiate her attack to finish that forehand out wide. Um, but she played a really good controlled backhand into Sophie Wu's forehand, which we also noticed that throughout this game, Sepinovich is electing to hit a lot more of the shots of the Sophie Wu forehand. Uh, I think that for some choppers, they get a lot more on the ball when they're chopping off the backhand side versus the forehand side. So she has been playing. If we had one of those trackers, we're going to see the ball more on, on uh, the right side of Sophie Wu. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think also much, much harder to control the height of the ball with smooth rubber. Obviously with the long pips you have a lot of help reversing the spin or taking spin off the ball but chopping with smooth rubber can be a, a lot more challenging. And you can see there a smart play by Sophie Wu. She twiddles the racket over, gives a float ball with the long pips off the forehand side. Just a great point there and great recovery by Sofia Sefanovic of Texas Wesleyan as she's able to step in and pick up that net ball quickly and just readjust to get herself back in an offensive position as she wins the point. She still trails here in game number three, nine seven, but and again handles the net ball really well and she gets another point. Just a moment here in the game break, Matt. We're going to have you explain to some people at home a little bit about the twiddling and uh, some of the advantages of it. So two game points for Sophie Wu. Stepanovic saves the first. Saves the second. Ties things up at 10 each. If she could steal away this game, it would be pretty good for her considering how things have gone throughout the third. And Sophie Wu goes for a big counterattack there. And it was the right ball. I mean, she got one high enough that she could step around and hit it. She just wasn't able to connect on the table. She's one of those forehands that you for sure want back.
Oh, that's a rough way to end the game. Stefanovic escapes with a win in game three. And I use that word lightly, affectionately escapes with one because it was still definitely Sophie Wu's game. So for her to lose literally four straight points uh, to end out that game, it's, it's just a, a horrible way to end it. But she's not out of it. Um, Stefanovic has turned the tables a little bit here as she was completely out of sorts in game number two. She takes game number three in deuce. And uh, if you're watching or paying attention, you've noticed that Sophie Wu... As a defender, she's twiddling, and you're seeing the two different. Uh, well, you're seeing both sides of the rubber being played on one on the backhand mat. So, talk a little bit about twiddling and and how effective it can be. Yeah. So, a lot of the time, uh, you obviously when you're using long pips on one side, you always want to make sure that whatever you're doing is to your advantage. Um, and you need to be in control of what spin you're playing, what's coming off your racket. Um, a lot of the time on the drop shots, so when somebody's pushing the chop, if you play against that with the long pips, there's nothing to reverse, so the ball's gonna be float. Sometimes the player will do that. A lot of the time they'll flip the racket over to the inverted side so they can produce some backspin. Um, we also did see on a couple of occasions Sophie switching the long pips onto the forehand side just to produce that float ball. Keep, I mean, variation is such a big part of defending. So making sure that your opponent doesn't have any comfort or any rhythm. As I said before, if you're playing all backspin, like we saw in the first game, then the attacking player just gets to pick and choose how they play the ball. Um, you don't want to give them a a controlled environment where they can just freely do as they will. Um, and I think Sophie's done a really good job of changing that environment a lot. That's what you call, at, again, a high-level player, smart defender. Um, we've seen at the recreational level some defenders and shoppers, it's just predominantly long pips on one side and they don't have mm -hmm. that ability to make the adjustment. Um, so it's easy to overcome that, you know, with a simple com combination of spins um, if you're a smart tactical player about it. But here we are here, an early timeout called by Sophie Wu. She trails 2-1 in this round of 32 women's singles. So very early time out here from MIT, Sophie Wu. And the winner of this matchup will have the pleasure of facing the number seven seed, Faith Tong of UCLA. Stefanovic looks much more in control here, starting the fourth. Of course, she has a lot of experience in her corner as well with Doru, head coach of the Texas Wesleyan team and former U.S. national women's and men's team coach, high performance director. I think also a many-time Romanian national champion himself. Just a great backhand out wide there. Sophie Wu can only laugh at it as it was just a well-played ball from Stefanovic. Yeah, you can see she didn't drop her racket too much either, which was smart. Knowing that Sophie was playing with the long pip side, wouldn't be as much backspin on the ball. She seems to have 
readjusted herself as reading every ball much better. And just a little late on the footwork positioning. Game number four here for Stefano is looking a lot like game number one where she's just really spinning the ball well. And it never hurts to get a few cheap ones in there as well, right? It's less work for you when you're playing a defender. Yeah. Very rarely are you only going to get one or two balls from them. You usually have to put in a lot of work. Set up there from Sepanovic. Very heavy top spin on the first ball. Misplayed ball there by Sepanovic, and she knows that she gave one back that should have been put away. See, there was a, it was another long pips push from Sophie, I think, just floated deeper and higher than <laughs> Stepanovich was expecting. Very well put together point there. Gets the job done with a flick and counter follow-up. Three games to one. Sofia Sepanovic from Texas Wesleyan wins this round of 32 women's singles match. Plenty of ups and downs in the match. Would have been very interesting to see how things would have played out if the third game had gone in favor of Sophie Wu. Because... Sepanovic really looked like she figured things out in game four. Came back into great position controlling the table. I think overall just she seemed very confident with the defensive style. Yeah, much more comfortable in game number four. As I mentioned, it, it looked reminiscent a little bit of game number one. And, uh, you know, Sophie was just uh, didn't have enough uh, to overcome the Sefanovic firepower there in that last game, and Sefanovic moves on to the round of 16 where she will face the number seven seed Faith Tongue of UCLA. Again, if you're just tuning in with us, this is day three of the 2024 Collegiate National Table Tennis Championships. I'm Joe Wells. Alongside me is Matt Hetherington. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back momentarily.
And here we are, Matt, back in action. Men's singles round of 32. Darren Douglas, Texas Wesleyan versus Alexander Wu of UCLA. Another attack and defense matchup here on table one. But unlike the last match where we saw Sophie electing to just really push, push, push heavy, Alexander showing you that he is not going to be shy about stepping around and hitting big forehands. do have a matchup here as Douglas the 13th seed, Wu the 17th seed, closely rated, separated by roughly 42 points between the two of them. So on paper it means that this could go any either way. I think it's going to be heavily uh, set up by Styles. how well Darren Douglas handles the modern day defender um, of Alexander Wu of UCLA. here for the first game. Five, Douglas plays back-to-back -back forehands, one in the bottom of the net, one of them long. And Alex Wu with the counter. formerly a member of a larger U.S. youth team. Back when we had one, used to be one U.S. national team with a mix of men's under 18 and under 15 players. Darren grew up in Trinidad and Tobago playing table tennis. I remember him coming out to New Jersey for a couple of summer camps at LYTTC. I don't know how many years ago now. Matt quickly aging himself there as he's been around the sport a long time, seen a lot of players, been a lot of places. Alex Wu was in his day of playing table tennis uh, one of the few top juniors that came out of the uh, Learning Tree Center in uh, California. That's Stellan Bankson's table tennis club. Yeah, Stellan and Angie having a big impact on table tennis in the U.S. Uh, one of our volunteers here that you've heard on the air, Logan Zimmerman has uh, had the pleasure of working out of that uh, same club when he was in California. So Darren Douglas playing with a lot of forehand power when he gets his lower body in position. That's up three game points here in game one. And 
again, that is a, a great rally exchange there from Darren Douglas as he puts together a series of big forehands to close out game number one, 11-7. small adjustments here and there from Alex Wu could make a big difference. We definitely saw him hit two or three top edges off his racket where he just wasn't quite positioned well for the ball. And it definitely also looks like Douglas is he's hitting really big forehands but he's going the ball is going through through more versus spinning up where sometimes spin gives you a little bit more time. Mm. Um, even though it has a lot of movement on it, it's slightly slower. But those last two forehands that we saw from Douglas, they were definitely uh, not really flat, but less rotation and more through the ball. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of direct power from him. He's a very, very active player around the table, so always looking for chances to play aggressively. Alex Wu's task really is to slow him down and to create some time for him to get those forehands in. Yeah, and I can see there, just even from the first this uh, first point here, Darren Douglas not wanting to get in any kind of long push exchange with Wu. Much more comfortable wanting to spin out of the box. chops in a row from Wu. Certainly needs to increase the backspin rotation as much as he can to take Douglas's power game out of play here. Great point there from both players. Great counter from Alexander Wu. He's a pretty tall player. He has good reach out to the corners of the table and beyond. This fast kick serve from Douglas into the backhand corner has been working well a couple of times for him. tentative there from Alex Wu. Darren Douglas ties things back up at four points each. Five. Douglas overcooks that forehand, but it's definitely a ball that he wanted. forehand counter. Yeah, and Alexander Wu set that one up nicely. He anticipated a uh, big forehand when he saw that uh, soft top coming off the racket of Darren Douglas. Alexander Wu leads 6-5 here in game number two. Again, you're watching a round of 32 men's singles on the third and final day of this 2024 Collegiate National Table Tennis Championship.
What a great point from both players. Douglas ultimately coming out on top. Great deception there from Alexander Wu as he caught Douglas leaning right and plays a very controlled topspin forehand out wide to the backhand. for the half long ball. You see him take a lot of those half long openings inside out, slow to the back end. Not having too much fortune with the step around forehand so far this match. just the sign that Dan Douglas got a little anxious. I think he played the last two points on the returns very well, keeping the return really low, but uh, really rushed that last forehand. away with a pretty quick little point there. Alexander Wu from UCLA takes game number two. Yeah, I do feel like Alexander kind of escaped with that, uh, that second game there. Darren Douglas had some opportunities to get it tied up and maybe take that game to deuce. Getting some bonus replays there of our first match here today. <laughs> Had some great singles matches here already. They're only going to get better as the day goes on and as the rounds get closer towards the medal stages. And just to give you folks that are concerned about points and ratings and to recognize those things at home, to give some context to this match here in this round of 32 singles, you are seeing two 2,400 rated players, and we're only in the round of 32, Matt. Wu's serve return is really important here uh, in this match. He needs to make sure that Darren's not playing full power on the first ball. When you're playing defensively, if, if somebody plays a hard and fast ball at you and you're chopping, it's really hard to generate spin or to generate heavy spin on the way back. And he needs heavy spin, so a strong serve return will help him set up a ball that allows him to chop heavy and then keep Darren spinning the ball up instead of playing power. There, Alexander Wu misplays a step around forehand. Darren Douglas off to a good start here in the third game, 3-1. 
Yeah, he's definitely struggled with the step around forehand in this match. We've seen kind of different shot timing not working out for him. A couple of top edges, unforced errors. And you can see Douglas, he's just continuing to try and I guess almost bait Alex into trying to step around. Yeah, so you can see here, once Darren gets in and he plays with more power, there's less time to control the chop, less time to produce spin. Ball trajectory is higher, less rotation on the ball, much easier for Darren to continue paying power forehand. Darren Douglas getting exactly what he wants as he opens up that point with a beautiful soft touch return. Alexander Wu has no choice but to, s to return back with spin, playing right into the favor of Douglas. There we see again that fast hook serve. Always managing to entice Alex Wu to step around. And so far the error rate against that serve has been really high. And this time straight at the body. So some really good placements here from Darren Douglas. And yeah, these points are going really fast. I think Alexander Wu would benefit from just trying to slow down in between the points because Douglas is really in his zone right now. So Wu serves nice and wide to the back end. And again, I really, really love the patience from Darren Douglas there on that last point. And again, the long, fast serves really catching Alex Wu out. Again, Matt, nothing wrong with that play. Douglas got exactly what he wanted. And a loose forehand again. It looks like, unfortunately, in that third game, the forehand just really let Alexander Wu down. He was never able to truly connect on, on many of them. Darren Douglas electing to play a lot of very con soft, controlled returns but at least it gets the ball spinning and uh, Alexander Wu was playing into opening up with spin as well back to Douglas, but that's exactly what he wanted, Matt. And uh, he was comfortable with going loop after loop, sometimes hitting three or four of them in a row. Not necessarily all of them power loops. Some of them were controlled heavy top spin loops, mm. um, but his game plan right now seems to be working. Yeah, I think the tough thing for Alex is, you know, if he's really in good form, and, you know, college players, <laughs> when they were juniors in table tennis, not juniors in, in university, but um, when they were training a lot, uh, everything's much sharper. Obviously, in college, you still see all the skills, but some of the players, now that they're focusing on studying, it's, it's really hard for them to kind of shake some of the rust off. And the unfortunate thing for Alex Wu is that his forehand swing is quite big. And so getting the timing and the feeling right for it when you're not practicing as much as you did before can be really tough. Um, and I think that's been a major problem for him in the match so far as we keep seeing 
kind of missed timings and top edges. There, it's a better play from Alex Wu. Steps into the ball. Slightly shorter swing. Great rally. Alex Wu mixing things in. Gave himself plenty of space to play defensively on the backhand. Smart little play there to play with the long pip side when he came back into the table. He's loving that little angle, playing the backhand across to the forehand side. Yeah, we've seen that a number of times throughout this uh, match here so far, Matt. And this is uh, exactly the start that Alexander Wu needed just to get also just a couple free cheap points as well. Yeah, and the danger here for Darren Douglas is that if Alex Wu starts finding a better timing for his forehand and cuts those errors out, then that could spell some trouble for the Texas Wesleyan player. And a lot of times you feel like when you've got a, a comfortable lead early to start, it's okay maybe to take a few chances on it because it seems like he's still trying to find that range on the forehand side. Um, I think for him right now, probably not, just because he doesn't want to play more risk. Uh, you know, he's got to find that right timing. So it's actually better for him to slow down a little. One of the first times that we've seen Wu flipping his racket over to try and push with the inverted side after chopping. So he uses a much harder and quite tacky rubber on the black side. opportunity was there for Wu. He's going to call a timeout after missing that. Yeah, and smart timeout there by Alexander Wu of UCLA. there from Wu just to recollect himself. Continuing to build momentum here. And not a powerful loop, but a well-placed forehand loop inside out there with heavy rotation. Great defending there from Alex Wu. Douglas took a big risk there. He had the shot. But, like I said early on in this match, Alex Wu has a pretty good reach to be playing forehand corner and even wider than that. That definitely went down, so that ball hit the side of the table. 
It's a nice opportunity there for Darren to potentially hit the shot of the tournament if he went for something a little bit more flashy. Be a little dive uh, yeah, drop. Yeah. Alex really cut that angle wide. Really great, great save off the net from Alex Wu. Just uh, one of those things that advantage the player with the longer reach. You can see him trying to work the chop more. Right now, Alex Wu, four game points to go to the fifth. We find Darren Douglas just overhitting on that last forehand there. Not reminiscent of what we saw in the first two games at all, where he was really connecting with the forehand. Sending the match to five. Another errant forehand from Darren Douglas. And you say to hate to see a match come down to this as it's just going to be, you know, a bunch of mistakes. If, if he's going to lose points, we'd like to see him, you know, be able to have these longer rallies that we saw in the first two games. Um, but just again, Alexander Wu staying in these points. As you can say, as the defenders, they, they will do, what they ne do what's necessary to keep the ball in play. Yeah, and Alex Wu's really steadied up a little bit, especially in the second half of that game. He's got to have confidence in his defensive play. I think maybe dropping the step around forehand if the ball's coming too quick and playing defensively instead is a smart move. But I think he has succeeded in slowing Darren down. So it'll be interesting to see how this fifth game plays out. Very interested to see what else, uh, what other strategy that Douglas might employ here in this fifth and deciding game. Again, the winter, winner of this will have the pleasure to go on to face the winner of the number two seed, Sharon Algeti, versus the number 38 seed, Han Ming Wei of Western. That is being played on the outside courts at table 20 as we speak. Oh. Darren Douglas has got to look for opportunities to get in with a little bit more power into the rally from the first ball. And see how much difference it makes when he finds those opportunities. Well, actually, it's not about finding them, it's about creating them. I think those slightly tentative drops are not going to help him. Yeah, I also think that one of the bigger differences from the early parts of this match is that. Alexander Wu is just doing a much better job on the opening topspin of uh, Darren Douglas. Mm. Yeah, he's kind of gotten one step ahead with how he uh, how he sends that ball to Darren. Again, that long hook serve, the long fast hook serve from. Douglas has continued to pay out points for him. I think if it comes down to any pressure situations, he could probably rely on that serve. Alexander Wu with a big forehand of his own. Still trails 3-4 in this fifth and deciding game.
And just like that, Darren Douglas up 5-3. Players will switch ends. Some really nice changes in pace there from Darren Douglas. Mixed in the drops. I liked that kind of earlier timing that he played on one of the shots as well. Great defending from Alex Wu, but ultimately Douglas gets the ball right at his body. And what a counter. Yeah. Darren Douglas did a great job of anticipating that forehand out wide with an even bigger forehand cross court. Yeah, that's not coming back. Straight into the corner of the court. 8-3, Darren Douglas just raising the bar one more time here. That would have been a backhand punch for the highlight reels, wouldn't it, Matt? Interesting to see Alex Wu looking for more third ball attack opportunities. Yep, stepping up the aggression here. That's a good sign for Darren actually. Kind of shows him that Alex might not be as confident trying to stick to defense. It's not hard to see why that might be the case. And Darren Douglas puts another third ball combination. Plays it really well. Not overheating on the forehand. Six match points for Darren Douglas. Goes for broke up the middle of the table. Doesn't land the shot, but he has five more match points, so plenty of opportunities to get the job done here. And we'll get this point. A great match from both players. Darren Douglas ultimately coming out on top. 11-5 in the fifth game. Texas Wesleyan having won now all three matches here on table one so far today and looking pretty good for their mission to add some more gold medals to their collection. Darren Douglas will set up a date with the 2024 men's doubles champion Sharon al of Indiana University. Up next here on table number one, we'll have women's singles round of 16. Jai Ni of Western versus Lavanya Marathurpanyan of UC Berkeley, or excuse me, of California. I'm Joe Wells, alongside me is Matt Hetherington. We're gonna take a quick game break and be back with you shortly.
Matt, here we are moving right along on day number three of singles action. This is the round of 16 women's singles from Western, the eight seed, Jiayi Ni versus the 13 seed from UC Berkeley, Lavanya Marathur Panyan. We've seen these ladies throughout the weekend of both of their, co of their women's teams uh, went deep into the team event the past two days. One thing that I do remember is that we're going to see some really big forehands out of both of these ladies as they look to uh, set themselves up to finish those points, and it's going to kind of live and die in the sword of the forehand. I liked the little quick check that uh, Lavanya did before they started warming up. It's just <laughs> set over the table. You've got short pips on your forehand, right? <laughs> Just want to make sure mm -hmm. that I know where the funk is coming from. Yeah, so you can hear during the warm-up that slightly sharper contact sound from Jai Nye. She's a short pips forehand player, so she can drive through the ball pretty hard and fast on the forehand when she gets the chance. Which is going to differ heavily from... Uh, what we saw earlier from Sophie Wu and the long pips. It's a completely different game, even though they're both pimples. The length of that pimple makes a huge difference. Lavanya Marutha Pandian is more of a, uh, say, like a controlling spin player. She has a reasonable amount of power, but a lot of the time she's very focused on creating ball rotation. So I think we'll probably see her playing heavy spin to the pip side. One of the things that really makes a difference uh, when you're playing against a short pips player is people tend to shy away from from the short pips because you play against it so much less they're like oh I don't want to play to the pips side I've got to try and play to the inverted side as much as I can but you can formulate some really strong tactics that can help you turn that pips into a disadvantage and I think one match that stands out to me the most a good example of that was when Lily Zhang won the Pan Am Cup for the first time and she beat Mo Zhang in the final who was Canada's top player with short pips on the forehand and Lily said I just kept going to the short pips like a lot of people uh, you know they, they want to stay away from it but she was like you know get your first spin into the short pips because at the end of the day when you have short you're fairly limited in what you can do if you haven't set up the chance to counter-attack. And it's also smart where you're getting the same ball consistently as well. You kind of can start to anticipate what's going to happen a little bit more versus going from side to side. It's a great rally from both players. Nia's yes, really solid in the rallies, kind of a little bit at the mid-distance. She's okay backing up and giving herself some more time. Just played that forehand a little too casual at sails long. Tied up three all here in game number one of round of 16 women's singles. I would expect to see a lot of those quick changes from Marutha Pandian, kind of combining spin and speed together to switch from the backhand to the forehand, puts that one straight down the middle of the table. So 
Vasera there. Jain, yeah, has had a pretty good tournament so far. They, alongside her doubles partner, Joyce Shu, they upset UCLA, the second seeds in the women's doubles semi final. So she took home silver in the women's doubles. Yeah, the Western women have had a very strong showing, like you mentioned, in doubles, but they did really good in the co ed event as well. Solid recovery there from Nia. So Jai Nia ties everything up here at seven each. Getting in some really strong backhand punches. Almost seems like things have gone downhill for Marutha Kandian after she missed her serve. She had a good lead. Over hits the forehand. You know, a lot of times we've heard talking to some of the athletes throughout the weekend, uh, particularly after a loss, they talk about their slow start and they mm. they go back to game number one, how they just didn't really have it, and uh, sometimes it carried on throughout the match. And Ruth Punyan goes down in game number one, eleven seven. Jaini continues her dominant play throughout this tournament. Not really phased or rattled too much in game number one. Would you say that Lavanya needs to maybe increase the, her energy a little bit? Maybe get herself mentally like just back into this match, even though you mentioned she missed a serve. Maybe she can pump herself up a little bit. I think she just needs to slow down a little bit. Um, I think spin is really the big factor here. When you're playing against someone who punches and smashes the ball, um, spin is your best weapon. And I think a couple of occasions Marutha Pandian just, she went for a little bit too much and maybe played a little bit flatter when she got into the rallies. And that's exactly what Jaini is comfortable with. I did notice Jaini actually able to spin a little bit on the forehand side, even though that is yeah. a short pips. Uh, it wasn't heavy, but it wasn't flat either. Yeah, so that kind of ball, really important. That should be a core part of what Marutha Pandian is doing. Just spinning through the first ball, not adding too much height, so a low, a low spinny ball to start. If she can get it to the forehand, she's probably going to get some softer returns from near. a good change in placement and we saw that a lot early in the first game as well was Lavanya quickly shifting the ball from the backhand side to the forehand yeah good adjustment there Just a misplayed return there from Jayini of Western. Ruth Aponian takes an early lead here in game number two. She's up 5-2. Let's see if she can hang on to this lead to 
tie it all up at one game all. Definitely more balanced approach here from the California Berkeley player. And it looks much more comfortable out there right now. Yeah, just a great soft touch return there. Opens up the court for her to get an even better ball to take forehand down the line. So spin top spin from Maruta Pandey is really going to be the key to slowing down the rallies. You add a little bit more arc. Helps the pace of the rally slow down. Okay, you need just really late to step around on that forehand. She played it pretty, pretty long, pretty loose. Big, big forehand there from Maruta Pandey. Inside out, she has now had a nice sizable lead in the second game, She's got to be careful here. This is kind of where she gets lulled back into taking those bigger shots. So five game points for Lavanya Maruta Pandian from California, Berkeley. Takes the first one off the serve. Ties up the match at one game each. Yeah, just night and day there between game one and game number two. Lavanya Marathur Ponyan connecting on a lot more forehands to finish the points. Jayini playing quite a few of the uh, returns loosely, not stepping around and moving as well as she was in that first game. Giving Lavanya a few free point, a few cheap points there as well. We're now tied up 1-1 here. Round of 16 women's singles. If you're just tuning in, I'm Joe Wells. Alongside me is Matt Hetherington. This is the third and final day of the 2024 Collegiate National Table Tennis Champions Championships. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors: Yola, Visit Eau Claire, Pong Space, Bluestone Designs and Creations. United States Coast Guard, NCTTA, and all of its staff and volunteers here. Really exciting weekend, Matt. I know that we've seen a bunch of great matches, but we know that there's going to be so much more to go. We talked about how just in the round of 32, we were already seeing 2,400-level players. Many, many years ago, that would have been probably a quarterfinal or semifinal matchup to have 224s, but now we're seeing it so much earlier in our day. Yeah, and let's not forget that top men's singles seed, Nikhil Kumar, is currently rated 2781. I think I, I would I would imagine I'd be pretty shocked if he wasn't the highest rated player NCTTA's ever had in the men's singles draw. And we are talking about U.S. national team member Olympian Nikhil Kumar. Mm -hmm. What a great play from both. Maruta Pandian holding it together, but Jai Nier finishing the point off in style. You could see Maruta Pandian really trying to focus on s changing spin and speed. So she's switching up, playing heavy topspin, then pressing the ball forward, just mixing in a lot of different variations into the rally. I 
tiny knee, just punching that backhand a little long. And Lavanya gets herself out of a trap there. A couple of reactive shots. First one, perfect body placement from Chiaoyi. And Marutha Pandian recovers again, but just a bit hasty on the opportunity to finish the point. Well, I like the patience of what I saw. She just unfortunately didn't get around that forehand fast enough. And it looks like Jaini being very aggressive on that backhand punch, not giving Marutha Panyan enough time to get around on the uh, backhand roll there. Yeah, I think he has been very direct this game. We've seen Lavanya caught out of position and caught off guard quite a few times. That's when Marutha Pandian starts timing things too early that she starts rushing a little bit. Much better timing there. Great rallies here from both players. Both players not afraid of chain exchanging blows between each other. Like two champion prize fighters going jab for jab. And Jainia just cleaves that serve return down the line. And another miss serve from Marutha Pandian at a pretty important stage of the game. and direction there from Aruthah Panyan. Jaime has been really solid on execution when it comes to those short pips forehand attacks. She's been hitting her mark pretty consistently throughout this match. Three game points for the Western player. Martha Ponyan still has life here in this third game. She trails 8-10. Ladies taking a quick towel break. I think the story of that game kind of put on display right there in that last point. You can see Jainia just painting that middle third of the table, looking for the elbow, looking for the body. Yeah, really. A lot of body shots in that game. Smart play, right? Not allowing Ruth Apanyan to get to either wing to start spinning. Jainia looking like she's very comfortable with that quick off the bounce exchange. While well, Marutha Panyan can definitely hang with her in that, she definitely wants to, like you mentioned earlier, Matt, get back to spinning the ball if she can. But Jaini not really giving her any opportunities uh, for that in that third game. Well, I think Lavanya has to be a little bit more deliberate. All of these shots that we see that are kind of heading her in the elbow, usually 
she's showing the backhand side of her racket. So she is a little bit predisposed to playing backhand across the middle of the table, but she's much better at control spinning with the forehand side. So if she wants to take some of the pace off, she I mean, she's great playing at the mid-distance. You can see in that forehand there, perfect example. It's like half a step backwards, just rolls through the contact with the forehand. She needs to give herself more time on the forehand. Because right now in these rallies, we're seeing a lot of quick backhand to backhand pace. And Nia loves that pace. She's just eating that pace up. Yeah, it was definitely uh, favored uh, for the player from Western when they got into those rallies. Yep, yep. She has much more compact strokes, quicker hands. No way. What a great point from Lavanya Marutha Pandian. Lavanya really dug deep to stay into that point. Yeah, so you can see, I mean, Lavanya's coming out of the gate, serving fast, inviting the fast ball. She's setting the pace of the rally from her serve at the pace that her opponent wants to play at. Drops a forehand just into the bottom of the net. She saw the opening cross court, just wasn't able to finish it. Effort there from Jai Neef trying to get back to that ball, but even better touch from Marutha Panyan as she has her player diving to the floor. I think when you're playing against someone who counter hits like that, the depth of the ball is really important. So, see these. Kind of short backhand flicks that Marutha Pandian is playing. They're kind of bouncing halfway up her opponent's side of the table. That gives Nia a chance to press into the ball, to push her body weight forward into the ball. What a turnaround. Some solid rallies here. Continuing a grander theme of this match. A lot of quick rallies, changes in placement. What I really liked in that previous point was the inside out. Uh, Marutha Panyan putting her footwork on display in that point. Bit of momentum coming back here to Marissa Pandian. Right now it's seven all here, Matt. It's a matter of who's going to bend first as these ladies are looking to exchange blows. Particularly starting off with the backhand to backhand. Ruth Apanya definitely got a, a forehand that she was looking to spin. Unfortunately, a lucky bounce off the top of the tape. Yeah. 
just like that, Maruta Pongin finds herself down two points as she trails Jaini of Western 9-7. So three match points for Jaini from Weston. She won't get the first one. And Ruth of Pandian just swats that ball away. Definitely some style points there. She's still going to need two more points just to level here. Oh. And Jainia with a great step around on the serve receive there. She wins 11-8. 3-1 for Jainia from Weston to advance into the women's singles quarterfinal. So as we continue to progress through the singles draws, we head back next to the men's singles round of 16. Pretty big match between the seven and nine seed, Vade Chef, Eduardo Tomoike. It's next up on table one.
All right, men's singles round of 16. Probably one of the most thrilling matchups in the round of 16 men's singles, which is why I put it on table one. Eduardo Tomoike, the ninth seed from Texas Wesleyan, playing Vay Chef. California Berkeley, the seven seed. Eduardo Tomoike is probably has my favorite playing style in the men's singles draw. He is the only traditional Japanese pen hold player in the men's singles. You can see he has a slightly more rectangular shaped racket. J-Pen players renowned especially through the late 80s and early 90s in Korea, but also in Brazil. So Japan, Korea, Chinese Taipei, Hong Kong, lots of JPEN players, but also in Brazil, which is heavily influenced by Japan, Japanese culture. Eduardo growing up and playing in Brazil. We'll see if we have the pleasure of seeing him hit a traditional pen hold backhand. He'll definitely use the backhand side to kind of punch around and control the ball. But sometimes if you're really lucky and the ball's set up well for him, plays some incredible kind of backhand bomb shots with the Backhand side. Eduardo off to a great start here in the match. Vade is going to have to work really hard to find that backhand side. Eduardo moves really well around the table. Always looking for forehands. Probably wasn't the forehand that he was looking for, but he got away with it. Eduardo was part of the winning Texas Wesleyan co-ed team yesterday evening. Yeah, and during that co-ed final there, Ved Shaw had an amazing performance in the semi-final round to lead his team to defeating NYU. Came up a little short in the number two singles against Jonathan McDonald. But as you can see here why Red Shaw was able to be a major factor in his team getting to that uh, co-ed final with just some amazing speed. And well, Chef ties things up. Six points each. Eduardo got out of the gates pretty quickly, but Vade Sheth has, I think, probably been one of the fastest developing players in the last year here in the U.S. Really picked his level up. Yeah, we saw on display just some amazing power, but also his ability to recover. Um, when stretched out wide, he's just a really fast young man. What's up? Oh. 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 There's that backhand block from Tom how much things switch up between the backhand and forehand side 
in terms of aggression. These traditional pinhole players often using the backhand for control and really precise placements. Yeah, just some great consistency off the backhand and forehand exchange quick there. Just a little bit much for Tomoike to handle. Wow. <laughs> he was really prepared to hit that ball hard, but gripped that ball really well. Just the spin, just barely covering over the net, just so much on that ball. It looks like there's nothing, but I, I assure you people, that ball is spinning. Great serve variation from Chef. Okay, taking advantage of that more controlled backhand side of Tomoike. Tomoike showing a third ball attack of his own. Just so explosive over the table on the forehand side. What a counter attack from Vaidchef. Short touch from Tomoike. Look at the pickup, but. Excellent footwork, positioning, and balance from the Berkeley player. Red Shaw has a game point of his own, 12-11 in the first. each a lot of pressure here already just in the first game Red. too long and chef showing some amazing recovery there and even more control as he gives him a little snake under the table. A little spin kick, a little too far for Tomoike as Tomoike carries that ball long. Game point, Chef. And again, Tomoike overcooks the forehand. Not that did clip the edge. So he did overcook it, but Fortune just helped him there. What a smooth forehand counter. Okay, getting some coaching in between that point from Los Angeles Venturo. And Bade Chef takes game one, 15 13. Very closely contested battle here in game one. 
this best of five men's singles round of 16 here at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. And as the day goes on, the stands start to fill in. A lot of the local community here of Eau Claire coming out to see some table tennis at its highest level in the country. We've been spoiled so far this weekend, Matt, with the matches that we've been able to see. And hopefully you folks watching at home have been able to enjoy that as well, particularly around the country. A lot of these athletes not only playing for their institutions and their teams, but also for programs around the world. A lot of people are able to enjoy this live stream, but you'll be able to follow it on the future NTTA YouTube page as well. Explosive forehand from Chef to start game two. Taking no prisoners there. You can see Vade kind of just doing a float forehand flick to the backhand side of Eduardo. You gotta mix up the pace into that backhand side. Eduardo's, he's not really able to generate power of his own unless he's swinging through the backhand, which is really tough to do with the j pen grip. Just Vet feeling real frisky on that step around. Just like that, two cheap points for Eduardo Tomoike to get him back and to get himself back in the second game. You can see how much body it takes for Tomoike to play backhand. Maybe he's using the same side of the racket, not the reverse side, so to lift the ball off a backspin or a float ball, you have to kind of hit a little bit outside of your body and use some rotation. Sails the forehand down the line long. It clips the top of the net. We are tied four all here in this round of 16 men singles, game number two. Actually, I think the last time we had a strong pen holder playing in the uh, men's singles for college was actually the last time we were here. Jeff Yamada was playing for Lindenwood back then. So certainly rarer, rarer these days to see high level penhole players. And you know Jeff actually ended up switching to play shake hand and <laughs> Dan Liu, who's also a top player in the US. He also switched to shake hands, so sport has gradually changed landscape a lot over the years. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, Jeff Yamada also from Brazil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of a lot of uh, penhole players in Brazil, especially the J pen players. I think Jeff was C pen though, which was kind of strange. C pen without the reverse. C pen is the the round shape bracket. Yeah. yeah. But he he didn't have uh I think 
Actually, I think he was still traditional, yeah. That no, was probably just a matter of comfort in the uh, in the uh, hand, the grip, and the uh, racket handle. And Eduardo, a very strong young man, he throws so much of his body into those forehands. Jeff has really put himself in the driver's seat in the second game. Just an amazing forehand flip kill there off of one leg for Eduardo Tomoike of Texas Wesleyan. Still has a slight mountain to climb as he trails 10-8 here in the second game. break on the net there for Sheth. Saves himself from a potentially difficult situation there. Wins game number 2-11-9. And we had Ved Sheth of UC Berkeley in the driver's seat over the number nine seat, Eduardo Tomoike of Texas Wesleyan University. As we come out of this game break here, Bed Chef of UC Berkeley up 2-0 on Eduardo Tomoike of Texas Wesley in this men's singles round of 16. Matt, what do you think that Eduardo needs to do to turn this thing around after having such a, a great performance last night in the co-ed event? I think it's tough, but he definitely needs to initiate first in a way that's kind of oh that's a great point great to see him getting in with the backhand attack yeah I mean he's going to have to be prepared to really play with more aggression Vade is just he's been so aggressive so assertive I think Tomoike has to match that so maybe a little more explosive. Needs to be careful with his first loop that it's not, I guess, ripe for the picking for a counter loop. Beautiful backhand drive there from Vedjep up the line. A 
again. I think Sheth has just been really solid with the forehand counters. Anytime the ball is dropping lower than the table and Eduardo is having to pick it up with topspin, Vade just really has his timing down. Just a huge forehand rip up the line there from Bet Jeff. And it looks like within these past few points, he's feeling it, Matt. Looks like they've got Bruno working overtime. He's coaching tables one and two. Okay, trying something a little different there. Long and fast down the line. Throws in a chop block. I think ultimately just once the tactics are set for Vade and he has a good idea of what he needs to do to play against the J-Pen traditional player, his level is enough that it becomes really difficult for Eduardo to try and push his way back into it. I mean, this is typically why we've seen j Pen kind of disappear from international table tennis. It was really good in the 38mm ball era. Um, so that kind of late pickup and big counter looping rallies, full table forehand, um, they were really strong. And, you know, as I said, through the late 80s and... 90s and even with Ru Sung Min winning the Olympic Games in 2004 but in this era of the game when people are getting in and backhand flicking and playing so fast close to the table with the backhand the traditional backhand style just doesn't really doesn't really hold up well enough against uh, against this era of table tennis and you can see there the ball just kind of comes off plane you know, the racket angle is very open. Players are really looking to add as much acceleration and topspin as they can. A lot of wrist action on the backhand. Tom K not having too much luck today with the nets, but... Bedshaw can see the finish line here. Oh, and Samoyke just gives him a errant return there. Bedshaw has match point 10-5. I hate to see Samoyke go down without a fight. And there you have it, big forehand up the line. He lives to see another point. Heavy topspin to the body. Bade Sheth is the winner of the match. Three games to zero. Advances into the men's singles quarterfinal. Yeah, just a great display there of mixture of spins and control. But ultimately, Bade Sheth coming out on top, being the aggressor, particularly off the counters, Matt. Uh, he's able to anticipate a lot of those spins from Tomoike a little bit better than most. 
So singles continues here on table one soon with a women's singles quarterfinal between Emery's Crystal Wong and UCLA's Faith Tung. We'll be back for that in just a few minutes.
quarter mile. On table one, we have a chance to signal four miles. UCLA, Bay of Tong, Emory, Crystal Wong, our umpire is Leo Kai, and this is by Eric. Welcome back to the Women's Singles NCTTA Collegiate Championships. Starting up right here again with the quarterfinal round. We have the seven seed Faith Tong from UCLA going against the three seed Crystal Wang from Emory University. Justin D'Antonio here with Stephanie Shea. What do you think about this matchup, Stephanie? Um, I do think Crystal's got the edge, um, but let's see if UCLA can make a compelling uh, competition here. So for the camera crew, Faith has a fantastic backhand, so let's see if we can focus in on that. Crystal's pretty solid on both sides, but uh, there should be hopefully some good rallies here. So I've seen uh, Faith play a few awesome matches this weekend already. Haven't had a chance to see any of Emery's uh, Crystal Wong. Uh, what, what's your experience with Crystal's game? Funny you should ask. So I think we may have played at one point many, many years ago. Um, I think she was nine and she destroyed me. And that's why I quit table tennis. Oh, oh. <laughs> Just kidding. Fun, fun little backstory if anyone hears any vitriol in Stephanie's commentating in the next uh, match here. Nice soft opening there, and I think there was less on it than uh, Faith was anticipating and dunks it in the net. One, 
nice cross court open there. Um, and so I mentioned Faith's backhand is really nice. And the, the reason is because she, she gets that a good uh, touch point on the uh, high on the arc. So she's able to get good control and redirect kind of as she likes. So she's taking it very early. Yes. Okay. And you'll see it. From the net cams. So that one, uh, Crystal put a little bit of extra spin on it. Uh, so it causes Faith to have it fly out. And there again, sorry, uh, Crystal puts an extra bit of spin on that. Uh, catches Faith a little bit late and she pops it out. And again, that was a nice save. Uh, couldn't quite put as much power as she wanted to on it, but she got enough juice uh, to give it a little kick so it bounces and then just explodes away from Faith. Faith obviously coming off of some very spicy matches yesterday with her women's team making it to the championship match against Texas Wesleyan. See if she can carry that into today. Has to dig herself out of a three point deficit here though. And again, so Crystal's doing a nice job, not doing too, you know, not over hitting, not trying to do too much, putting some good spin, uh, and it's just enough to get it to go flying. Yes, Crystal, uh, again, the three seed, uh, stylistically, I'm seeing a lot of contrast between the one and two seeds styles. Yes, Faith here is the seventh seed, so sh there is a, a little bit of a spread, but I think to get back into it, she's got to cut the unforced errors. And I think, unfortunately, f for her a little bit, like she's not, st tactically, it's not the worst, but Crystal's just getting the shots back. Crystal sandwiched between uh, two players from Texas Wesleyan above her, uh, Zhen Deng and Jai Chi Lin, as far as seating goes, and two players below her from UCLA, Angie Tan and Joanna Sung. Faith is managing to save a few game points here. Let's see if she can manage to pull off a crazy comeback. So I think that serve for her is probably not the way to go um, because Crystal does have a strong two-wing game and placement of that serve was kind of not ideal. Like Crystal didn't have to move too far for her, so it was just right right there and she was able to, and obviously being up a lot, you know, it gives you a little more cushion to, to swing freely, but uh, that was right to her basically, so that's just target practice. So would you say that was more of a quality issue on that serve than like a choice of serve? I think both. I mean, when you're down 5'10", you, you might, you know, be a little bit mentally checked out and you're kind of like, all right, let's just move on and get to the next game. Um, but for Faith, I think the shovel pass, the shovel pass, the sho shovel serve that you saw a lot of um, more in the beginning, I think is probably the way to go. And so that's the equivalent of a backhand serve I, I haven't seen her do it so I don't know that that's like in her repertoire but the way that that s serve curves it serves the server's backhand better and since Faith has a stronger a strong backhand game that is going to be the way she wants to set herself up sounds like she's feeding the flames here with that serve 
see if she changes it up on this. So going back to that shovel serve. Starting game two here with a lead. Does Faith tell? Nice, slow, open. Uh, I think for Crystal, she was a little surprised by how soft it was and dunks it in. Oof. Ouch. Big kill on that short forehand. And that's by design, right? So she serves a little bit dead, a little bit side spin, uh, causing Faith to pop that up and easy money. If only these athletes were paid. It was a nice push there, had a lot of extra spin on it. Uh, definitely deep and threw off the timing a bit for, for face. That was a nice change of pace. So I think the, the what made that serve effective was the location. It definitely caught Crystal at a very awkward uh, contact point. There you go, that's nice. So you can see that she serves long underspin. She's, she wants Crystal to open it up. And then she, again, with that strong backhand, can actually counter loop on that, on that wing. Hope Alpha has that on replay. Calling out the tech crew. They do an amazing job. Working with them has completely changed the way I watch live sports. So insane respect for them. Oof, unlucky there. But yeah, t I was too busy calling out the camera crew, but on that replay, you can see again, Faith's backhand game on, on full display. Absolutely. In these firefights in the last few rallies, you've seen Faith able to keep up with the punches from both wings of Crystal. But when Crystal is able to redirect over to Faith's forehand, it's a little tough for her to uh, remain in the dominating position of those rallies. And also what makes Faith's backhand good and difficult to play against is she is changing pace, changing, changing speed on purpose. So she takes a little off, punches a little harder, and it, you know, the change in timing is definitely disorienting. Because this game is so reactive and, and predictive that you kind of get into a, a groove of, of what, what you're expecting to come next. And the more you can mess with that for your opponent, the harder it is for them. Nice misdirection there. Faith feeling really at home. Uh, shifting over to further right on the table than you'll see many players. Uh, kind of forcing the uh, opponent to... Oof, and Crystal was ready for that one. Really forcing the opponent to thread the needle if they want to get it to her forehand. She's just making eating up the whole table with her backhand and it seems to be working pretty well and you'll often see that if, if one if a player has a, a clearly dominant wing they'll try and cover more of the table with that um, absolutely although you'll see it a little less often when it's the backhand wing most players will uh, prefer their forehand wing I think for the women's game it is much more common Ooh, that was nice sure, down the line shot sure. there. And much more common for, for it to be backhand dominated. Um, you know, you can stay grounded a lot. There's not a whole lot of, you know, stepping around doing anything fancy. Um, and the, the game is too quick for you to, for most players to do that anyway. We're not all thin yapping here. <laughs> So 
Well, that serve placement was nice. It brought Crystal over, uh, forced her to move a bit. You can see they're moving to cover the forehand corner with her backhand, but didn't quite get the angle again to, to really put Chris Love out of position. It was a nice serve to save a game point. Caught her a little bit flat-footed on that one. Ooh, that was very nice. Um, so it, that, that push there forces, you'll see uh, Crystal to put up a kind of low quality shot, kind of, you know, right, right into her hands and left, left the left side completely open, or the right side rather. Nice down the line play to Crystal's forehand, taking game two putting her in a decisive lead, as we expected on paper. 11-5, 11-9. Faith has some work to do in game three. Going to have to bring it to a fifth game if she wants to be moving on to the semifinals after this. Well, that game was much closer. She does seem to be in a bit better rhythm um, but Crystal did find the edge at the end. So what do you expect if we end up seeing a semifinal of the one versus three seed Crystal versus Shen Deng after this? That'll be interesting because Crystal does have, and you can see like spinny, grippy shots, which is good against the, the pips. Um, of Texas. Um, the thing with the pips is you can hit them really hard and really fast and all they have to do is kind of stick their hand out and you know it'll it'll come back in the other direction but if you're able to vary the spin on it it makes their life a lot harder. Fair point. Let's see if Faith can come back and make this interesting. Again, game two very tight. Crystal able to pull away in the end. But Faith starting this game with a lead on her opponent's serve. That was a little bit of a missed opportunity there. And, and you see that Crystal makes her pay for it. Um, she wasn't quite ready to open on her forehand. Um, so she pushes it back and Crystal makes her, makes her pay for it. Spinny push there and dunks that in the net. So I think, yeah, she's definitely got to mix in the shovel serves and the pendulum serves. Shovel serve uh, yielding an error off of the paddle of Crystal there. And I think it is because she caught her off guard. She wasn't expecting a long, deep one. So I think as, as long as Faith can, as much as she can keep her guessing, the better. Because Crystal is very solid um, technically, so I think it'll be tough to just beat her straight on head to head with, with skill. Um, so she's got to pull out some mind games here. So, sorry, were you going to say something? Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, these players might have seen less of Crystal than of some of the other players because uh, the doubles and teams of that require you to have another, uh, at least one or, or two or three other strong players on your team to make a deep run. Um, and obviously Emery is not as deep of a team as UCLA and Texas Wesleyan. So. These players might be seeing her for the first time in this tournament. And you can see there in that replay just now um, kind of what separates them. Um, 
Faith made a nice shot that may, you know, for, for a lot of other players have been a winner, but Crystal's there. She's grounded and she's ready. You're there she kind of caught her in a moment of indecision. Do I step around? Do I stay in the backhand? And it results in, in an error. You can see she gets jammed right there. Yeah, I like that serve. I think she, I'm just not sure that she has a plan for the next shot. But if you're gonna serve that serve to the forehand short, that is where you would put it next to the, because that's the longest distance, uh, just as, you know, as, as a straight line, the short forehand to the long backhand. So if you're gonna serve it there, you wanna try and get as deep to the backhand corner as possible. Nice. And so awesome. Uh, again, wow. again, you see Crystal tech, strong technical mechanics, you know, paying off here, because I think for most other players that point would have been much shorter. Crystal giving a wry smile there. Certainly not happy with that edge ball. I think because she knows she got caught, um, you know, it caught, it kind of jumped up on her when she wasn't expecting it. Mistimed it. The speed these players swing, factoring in spin, the size of the ball. I tell you what, if I hit shots like them, I would miss a lot more than they do. And we have four match point opportunities for Crystal here. Time for Faith Tongue to go for that Hail Mary. I see what you did there. It's a nice backhand winner. We have Crystal Wong winning comfortably 3-0, 11-5, 11-9, 11-6 over Faith Tung of UCLA's, and so she'll advance now um, to the semifinal. Stay tuned for that coming up, and feel free to tune into court two for another UCLA player playing against an NYU player for the other women's quarterfinal. We'll be back in a bit.
Maria. And what school do you represent? University of South Florida. Okay, all right. Have you been to nationals before? No, this is my first time here. This is your first time? Yeah. Nice. What's your major? Uh, biomedical sciences. <laughs> we just have a lot of smart people in the house. Very good. How do you like nationals so far? What's your uh, experience so far? It's been an amazing experience getting to see like all the top players playing. The courts are really nice. It's just been great overall. So, I mean, how did you get into table tennis? I gotta ask. So it originally started me watching my brother play in the NCTTA. So it was kind of just watching all of these types of players playing, battling it out, and just seeing like the 2,000 players, 2,400, and just seeing like, okay, I want, really want to be able to do that at one point. And then I just tried it out for the first time, hit every single one off the table. And then the competitive side of me was like, okay, I need to actually start getting better. And I kept playing from there, and now I'm here. That's great. That's great. Uh, how are you doing in the tournament so far? Uh, so far, I've played the, only the women's singles, but it hasn't gone too great. I lost my bracket so far, but... You say you um, lost your racket? No, bracket. Like, oh, you lost your bracket. Okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Because that would be a much worse <laughs> yeah. situation if you lost your racket. Yeah. So I guess we're thankful? Yeah, thankfully I have that. All right, well, best of luck. Hope Thanks. to see you further on in the competition. All right, I am here live at the 2024 National College Table Tennis Championships, and I'm joined here with Thomas Hu. And tell us a little bit about your organization. Well, we're the largest youth table tennis organization in the country. Which is? AYTTO. Nice. And uh, we help kids from K to 12 to play table tennis. Uh, we organize competition now in eight states. Uh, across America, we have literally like thousands of kids and uh, many of them couldn't afford to play table tennis. Um, so this is very, very important for us because to grow the sport, we really believe we need to bring in more people, not just people you know, who could afford it. You know, I mean, right now what we see, the, the trend is everything is very expensive. So we work with a lot of the uh, high net worth uh, people with good heart, foundations. We go into the uh, inner city schools, the public schools. We uh, partner with Pong Space, gave out uh, almost 2,000 rackets to the kids already this year, just this year alone. And thank you to uh, the uh, sponsor for NCTTA, Jula, as well, to help us. And uh, hopefully we'll get to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of kids very soon. Absolutely, that's great. Now, you're also here on part of another organization, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, I'm also involved with Pound Space. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders uh, together with some other people in uh, table tennis. And maybe one of the people you know is Edmund Soon. Uh, the idea is really to connect from kids from K to 12 with AYTTO to colleges with NCTTA and to the professional um, workers who will play and all the way to the senior. Uh, so this way we could create like whole line of sight. We bring the sport together. We bring people together. And one of the things that we see is people want to compete and we have, you know, before he, his passing away, George Braithwaite, who was like a legend, uh, you know, he was also like having that spirit, helping from kids to adults, and and we follow his footsteps, and we created the uh, George Braithwaite Major League Table Tennis, uh, November, the year before, not this past year, uh, and it's been uh, very very successful with many clubs and corporates participating, and. The whole idea is to bring all these people together to, to leverage you know, their contact, their resources to make this sports grow. Gotcha. And I believe you're here to present something for us. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, yeah, we interviewed Danny a little bit earlier today. And he was last year's George Bayfrey Community Service Award for the uh, high school seniors. And this year we have Sean Chen. Congratulations, Sean. Sean is not only a really good player, but he's a really good student. He was actually uh, elected or voted by uh, media, uh, New York One in, in New York, uh, a TV station as a student athlete uh, of, the, of the month. 
and、uh, one of the very few. Is, you think about it, it's not just table tennis, you know, basketball, soccer,、uh, all the major sports as well. To 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 be at that position, you have to be a really good player, and you have to be a really good student. And I believe he's、uh, going to join one of the the、uh, major powerhouse. Of NCTTA pretty soon next year. I'm assuming that's to be determined. Yes,、uh, but I think May 1st is the day that, that、uh, he needs to make decision. So you know, all these teams out there, you guys, you know, time for you to make his commitment. <laughs> but yeah, seriously, Song was really, really helpful for us.、Uh, he was helping us doing exhibitions with like fundraisers. We did recently did a fundraiser for the uh, Turkish uh, kids who were amputated. They need the,、uh, you know, whatever they call it, the, to to help them walk again.、Um, you know,、uh, partner with Spin、uh, in New York. Spin actually a great supporter of us,、uh, both AYTTO and Punk Space,、uh, and the whole table tennis community. So and、uh, you know also Sean came and、uh, did a lot of the、uh, the volunteering coaching for us with the kids. So、uh, exceptional individual.、Uh, we look forward for him to continue following the footsteps with Danny to、uh, not just for high school kids now, but also for collegiate and and also you know the adults as well. Gotcha. All right. Well, congratulations again to Sean. Thank you again, Thomas. I will see you soon and、uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. It's an honor for me. What's in my bag? We're here with Angie Tan from UCLA. What's in your bag? It's Wisconsin. It's freezing here, so I have, of course, I have a really. Warm jacket with me. I bring it around 24/7, even though I don't wear it until like two minutes of the day, like the last two minutes of the day, because <laughs>、okay. I was freezing the first day. Like, what else you got? Real. Okay. Besides my ping pong stuff, my hair ties. Okay. My clips, bobby pins. I do notice that your hair is always up.、Yes. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to see the wall without it up. <laughs> um, one of my college friends want to exchange college shirts with me. And this one from Wisconsin. He's from University of Wisconsin.、So、That's cute. His shirt, yeah. Two versions of the UCLA、oh, yeah. shirt. You got the toe, guys. Can I, can I please show you the 2024 <laughs> UCLA shirt, guys? Like, look at this. Show us the back. Show us the back. The back's better. The back's better. But, but like, yeah, yeah,、okay. yeah. As you can see, like. Well, the superior one is on me right now. <laughs> This is like the 2021 version. What else you got? My water bottle. Is that a hydro flask? No, it's not. I But、okay. I carry this everywhere. Okay. <laughs> Cheetos. <laughs> Classic. Classic.、Yeah. What else? Ooh, you have a huge backpack. Dude, yeah. What do you? What, what do you? What else do you want me to whip out? My balls. <laughs> Anything that most people wouldn't. <laughs> oh, I got you. I have lip balm. Yo, that's so、here. cute. That's so cute. <laughs> I have lip balm in here. <laughs> that's it. Yo, look. Hold up. Can you hold that up to the camera? <laughs> This、so、is、cute. not a Vaseline advertisement, guys. That is. <laughs> that's so tiny. <laughs> How you doing? Good, thank you. How about yourself? I'm doing well. What's your name? My name is Nathan. Nathan,、yes. do you are you a local? I am, and I'm actually an alumni of the UWC from 2007. Nice, congrat. Well, good to see you here.、Uh, is this the first time you've seen, I guess, a national tournament? Yes, abs. Well, national tournament period. Yeah. Wow. Okay then. College. How do you like it so far? It's awesome. It's neat. It's a good family experience. Yeah, for sure. How, what do you think of the level of play here? Pretty darn good. Definitely better than me. <laughs> hey, everybody has a shot. <laughs> Have you considered going back to school?、Um, to play? 
to play? No. Uh, can you do that as an alumni? Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't know. Well, that. I mean, did you? So, have you played NCTTA? I have not played. Okay. Uh, so sport. you have four years of eligibility, so you can be a master student, PhD, whatever. All right. Uh, as long as you're eligible, you can play. Okay. Uh, how did you hear about this event? Um, online. My wife was looking for local things for us to do as a family, uh -huh. and we've come to the uni university here now a couple times. Gotcha, gotcha. Was this what you were expecting, I guess? Actually, yes. It's nice. It's exactly what I was expecting. It's, like I said, way better than me. <laughs> All good. But regardless, we're so happy for you to be here and hope you enjoyed the rest of the show. Oh, yeah, we're enjoying it a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Joined here by Mitch Pettyjohn, and I see you brought an entourage with you. I do. These are I am, and these are the innocent men. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. So our mission statement is to inspire others to experience and support music since 1985, and we've been a group on campus, an acapella group on campus since 1985, and uh, we have traditionally been a group of seven guys. We have eight right now, but on I can stage tell. we traditionally have seven guys, and we just all love to sing. Why seven? Seven is, honestly, why do we have seven? Is there it is just, no there's not really a real reason. It's just like how blend works and uh, all the different voice parts. We just have seven guys, yeah. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate you guys coming out. I believe you guys will be singing the anthem later. Is that correct? Yes, we're going to be singing the Canadian National Anthem as well as the U.S. National Anthem. Fantastic. Do you guys have an Instagram page that I can tell my followers? Yeah, if you look up on Instagram, the underscore innocent underscore men, you can find us on Instagram as well as Facebook, I believe. 
Gotcha. Well, I look forward to hearing you guys later. Thank you yeah, thank you very much. Of course. Oh, before we cut, I'll continue on real quick. Uh, gotta ask, is this your first time seeing like a, say, a table tennis tournament? This is the first time we've seen this, yeah. Uh, what's your guys' uh, impression so far? Honestly, pretty amazing. I didn't know it was this big of a sport, but it looks terrific and it seems like there's a lot of good players out here today. Gotcha, gotcha. No, yeah, for sure. And uh, I think definitely speaking to the scale of things, I mean, the fact that we took up two gyms is, is a says something it is pretty crazy yes yeah <laughs> have you guys ever considered competing actually a couple of the guys did want they were saying they wanted to compete they are uh, big fans of table tennis so all right well either way if i don't hear you guys which i will i'll see you guys later on the court then How are you doing? I'm Dean. And I'm Leah. Gotcha. Are you guys locals to Wisconsin? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. How, how did you hear about this event? Our friend told me, a friend told me about it who is really into table tennis. And we were just, yeah, we were interested. Yeah. Do you guys play at all? Yeah. No. We, we have a small ping pong table that we set up in our living room when we're really, really bored and it's cold out. It, it counts. It counts. And I'm sure it gets quite cold here. Yes. It does. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. So how are you uh, liking the level of play here or the competition in general? It's fascinating. It's fascinating to, to watch. I, 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 I see...
Welcome back folks to the 2024 NCTTA Collegiate Table Tennis Championships in Eau Claire, Wisconsin at the University of Eau Claire. We've got an awesome quarterfinal coming up for you between USC's Kai Zhang and Texas Wesleyan Sonora Silver. Silva. We have the four seed in Kai and the eight in Silva, but uh, an extremely strong player uh, from Silva, and I'm sure he's going to put up a heck of a fight here. He's going to have to. Uh, there's a hundred point spread uh, between the two of them, but you never know. Not sure what your favorite event is here normally, Steph? 100% co-ed teams. I, I kind of figured a lot of people say that. Normally, for me, that's the same. This year, I have been really looking forward to this event. Uh, it, I think it's really exciting here having three previous winners of the men's singles in the draw in Kai Zhang, Nikhil Kumar, and Sharon Algeti. So as things get tight, I'm, I'm curious if one of them is going to pull out the two-time champion status or if maybe we'll have a new winner. So as we gear up for this match, Camber Crew, you're going to have to be prepared for some wide shots because Kai likes to play pretty far away. So you can get ready for some hopefully compelling counter looping points here. Maybe not that one. But Kai does play a very big game. So you can expect him to be far from the table frequently. Haven't seen it yet, but it's coming, I promise. That's a nice uh, plyometric slap there from Sonura, giving him an early lead. And I think for Silva, because you know he's definitely the underdog in this matchup, he's going to have to take some risks. Uh, he can't really afford to play it safe. There's not a lot of margin for him. Kai is a pretty interesting player to watch, certainly uh, enjoyable for the spectators. And whether uh, Sonura is the underdog or not, Kai likes to make things interesting. And I suppose I shouldn't say he likes to, but in my experience, he tends to play long matches. Well, it's better for the viewers. Yes, I'm not sure. I'm, if I asked him, I'm sure he wouldn't say, oh, no, that's intentional, right? He wants to put it away as soon as possible. But uh, he is the comeback king. He, he plays a lot of five-set matches deep in tournaments and somehow finds ways to get the job done. And I think part of it, too, is it might look like it's, you know, high highs and low lows, but I think what's actually happening is he's trying different things out. Um, and if that you know, result in being behind early. He's obviously figured out a way to make that not a problem because he makes the necessary adjustments later on. Finds himself in a pretty deep hole here though. And so if Silva strategizes appropriately, he'll actually avoid the big long counter looping rallies that favor Kai. So maybe he'll make me put my foot in my mouth. And here's one, hopefully Bravo or Alpha has it. Holy guacamole, that was awesome. Big swings on both wings. And this is pretty typical. This is the sort of quintessential element of, of Kai's game. And the reason he can do this, and you can see in his swing, it's not, it's very balanced. So he's not out of position and he can keep going because there are some players, if they're swinging for the fences, they completely throw off their center of gravity and they're just nowhere ready for the next point. So, for Kai, he's going to want to try and initiate these types of points. Kai, I think, claiming that that uh, ball of his nicked the edge on that point. 
unfortunately we were dazzled by the big swing so maybe we didn't catch the the edge clip on slow-mo there did get a little side view but it is tough to tell when it just barely skims it you almost have to hear it versus seeing it very nice you see again he's not hurried he's not flustered his hands are high he's ready all he has to do is turn just a little bit have a tiny backswing and that's enough because the whole forehand side was completely open yeah that's a nasty counter punch He's claiming clip the edge again. I don't know if cameras caught that. He seems less convinced this time, though. The refs also seemed to not catch it, but... Uh, but they here. did give him the point. And Silva not really putting up a fight against that particular call, so we find ourselves at 6-8. And here we go. He's found his way back into the match. Or into the game, I should say. And so we'll see how Silva handles this, you know, mentally. I'm really liking uh, the body language from Kai. It's very subtle. Um, he's not a big energy, a loud player. But you can see he's... And in some ways, that can mess with your head, too. Um, if you're, you know, just played this big, crazy point and the person on the other side looks a little bored, it, it can be pretty deflating for you. you strong counter back ends there. And a really uh, optimistic indicator for Kai here, his backhand is looking to be really really on point i have seen in some of the big matches where he has trouble uh one of the things that seems to go for him is the timing on his backhand uh he'll just be taking them a little bit late and uh um, right drop so, a few into the net right so he's clearly he's clearly caught on to the timing here and those shots just looked so comfortable for him Granted, that may be a different story against some stronger opponents in future rounds. Correct. Because the differentiator at the higher levels is, you know, they, they adjust when you adjust, right? They'll adjust to your adjustments. You know, good players and most players will adjust whatever they're doing, but better players will see your adjustments and raise you one. So he, Kai comes back from a big deficit to take this first one. Um, I don't know how optimistic I am for Silva taking this match now, because usually when you're you're the underdog in a match, you want to try and steal the first one, because for the higher rated player, it's a little bit of a weight off their shoulders now that they can breathe a bit and play a little freer. Um, and you already saw at the end of that first game, Kai was very much swinging away. Um, so Silva's going to have to find a way to disrupt his tempo, his timing, and, and not let him dictate so much. It's easier said than done, but he's got no other option, really. Sunir so Silva, I believe, plays in the Major League Table Tennis, uh, professional table tennis league that was uh, begun this year. Uh, I'm not sure if Kai does, but he has played in, I believe, the Bundesliga in Germany uh, or another uh, European professional league at some point. Uh, and he's also taken wins off of top 40 players in the world uh, on the professional tour. So uh, both players are, are certainly decorated in the sport. Kai certainly with a few more bells and whistles on his jacket, though. So yeah, he, he seems to be in rhythm now, so let's see what Silva can do to disrupt that a bit. Starts off with a little bit of a fortunate misfire. But he'll take it. I think what you'll notice here too is neither of them neither of them have particularly tricky serves, or at least they haven't pulled them out the bag yet. So that makes it, you know, 
more conducive for extended rallies. Because a lot of times when you see strong servers, um, and they, ooh, that was a nice down the line forehand there. If you, if you see someone with a strong service game and then the opponent does not, um, they're just going to be always a little bit off balance. And that was a nice backhand kill there. Um, you know, and the whole game sometimes can just be a little bit, you know, touch and go. So Kai unloading there, but not able to kind of burst through the the defensive uh, capabilities of Silva for that particular point. And Silva there not doing too much, not doing too much staying in it. And finally he gets one he can handle and then puts a little bit extra pace on it out wide. That was nice there. So what he did was he, he got a middle, middle, and then away uh, down to the forehand side. Um, just enough to get Kai off balance and mistiming it. So Silva looks seemingly unbothered by dropping that first game, so that's a positive sign for him. There you go. That's what I'm talking about when I, when I say varying pace and tempo and timing. That one was a little squishy shot, um, and it just messed with Kai's timing. And another one, a slow kind of, I wouldn't say dead, but not, not a strong shot. Um, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, I just mean not with the pace and the force that Kai was expecting. And he finds himself in a hole again, down four. And the hole gets deeper. And Kai seems to be the one digging. Yeah, that was a little, I would call that an unforced error. I, like, I, I don't quite know why he was swinging so hard oh, yeah. for that one, oh, but. Yeah. But we saw in the first in the first game, a, you know, a multi-point deficit is not a big deal. Ooh, he had that one timed nicely. It was a little bit fortunate because I think it clipped the net, but it did still, the net, yes. he was ready. So you see, Silva ha had a little bit uh, another sort of softish shot, but this time Kai was ready for it. Really nice counter punch by Silva. Uh, Kai just did not have time to get there. Didn't really even need to generate any pace. Just took it all off of Kai's racket. Yeah, and I think it took a little bit of an awkward bounce that Kai wasn't expecting. He actually overran it a bit. So you see Kai changing pace there too. Um, and that'll throw off your your rhythm as a defender because you're kind of waiting and anticipating for, you know, come on, come on. missiles. And then you get one little soft one and then oops. It was a nice shot. I think a little net contact on there. Yeah, show. I was going to say it was a little bit of a miss hit, but yeah. he did intend to go in that direction. Not to say that it would have necessarily been a winner anyway, but he was definitely going for it. And so the hole has gotten shallower. And now it looks like he's taken ready taking to time reach out. out of that hole. Yes, uh, is it Silva taking the time out? I believe so. Yeah, that would make sense with where we're at. I think it's probably a one point overdue, but better late mm. than never. He's got a one or three. <laughs> you know, he really Fair he let him get pretty far out of that hole before trying to stop that momentum right and you can see there nice replay on with slow-mo he had that timed very nicely even though it was a miss hit he, he was ready for it both of these players just phenomenal movers you don't want to be pushing any long balls they'll make their way around it they'll attack on it so it's either got to be short or you know aggressive 
um, in some way. Just to, you can't just play the patient long game. It's got to be short or fast and placed. Right, extended rallies I think don't favor Silva here unless he can really, you know, change up change up all the, the timing and et cetera that we've already talked about. He has done well in the rallies where both players are deep. But he's not in a position of strength. He's kind of just fishing it back. Sure, and sure. Makes for an entertaining watch, but it's not necessarily fun when you're on the receiving end of that onslaught. Over hit that one. Um, he definitely had Kai out of position, so he stepped around on, a, on, on the backhand side with his forehand, left the whole side wide open, and I guess his eyes just got a little too big, a little too ambitious. Wow, so he definitely changed the spin and pace on that one, and Silva was not ready. Hopefully they caught that on replay. We saw a few big shots for Kai to get out of that hole. He was down, I think, 7-3. Um, and now, after that timeout, it, it seems like Sonura is making some lapses in judgment, uh, some unforced errors that are just fanning the flame that's under Kai right now in this game, too. Has managed to save one game point, though, so let's see if he can save another. That was a nice serve uh, serve attack sequence there. So you can see that he does that shovel serve from all the way on the forehand side, which leaves the backhand open, and that's the obvious option. Um, and so Kai just gave it right to him. Aggressive step around forehand there and pays off. So typically when you take big risk shots like that, you want to go as wide out as you can and and go for the all out winner, which he does. So he hit the, the edge of the white line. Yep, that's where all my shots land. Gotta take a few pointers from you then. Oh, well, the, you see, for me, I just painted the whole table white. Gotcha, gotcha. That's one way to do it. We're a deuce again, all tied up. That was a good serve there, and I think Silva a little overambitious on that return. Either that or he misread the spin on the serve. I think he's feeling the pressure to not push to Kai, though. That's probably true. A little bit of an unforced error there. Actually, your comment about painting the whole table white is interesting. I, it just made me think, like, it would actually be very disorienting if the lines were fatter or thinner. Just think about it. If you picture this, it looks fine because you're used to it. But then if you start messing with the dimensions, it actually would screw you up. I do believe I've seen some tables that have no lines. And I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think I've played on them, but yeah, that could... No, veto, I don't like it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in some tournaments, I know there are lines where they don't put a doubles um, split down the middle because, you know, there's not going to be a double serve, so it's unnecessary. Interesting. And there you go, so way back out of the hole and taking game two. For Kai. Lovely work from Kai. He just floats on his footwork to get to his inside out backhand. You'll see uh, him move. He can just take one massive lunge, you know, three to four feet over, just one big step, both feet, and he's just automatically set up for any forehand from that backhand corner. Yeah, the fundamentals are key here. So it, it's all in the, the legs. And I keep saying this, but it's high hands, right? And the reason that's important is because you're not wasting time or trajectory. When you're, when you're talking about milliseconds here, like a little bit of lost um, arc makes a big difference. So when you say high hands, are you talking physically like high 
relative to your body, or are you just talking like so active, he's ready not position? A little bit of both. Like you, you see that he his starting position. He's not dragging his hand out from like near the floor, right? Sure. It's intentionally high, so all he has to do is turn a bit, and that's enough, right? So it's a little pivot in the hips, and and the obliques. To, to, that's that's all. That's all the backswing that you need, right? So I think a lot of players you'll see they're the backswing is just too big, and so okay. it's, it's hard to catch the timing. And it, it, with those swingers, you'll tend to see a lot of balls off the, the edge of the racket because gotcha. they've missed the timing. Game three, Kaizong up two games to zero. Sonura Silva has some work to do. Let's see if this game is another seesaw. Or maybe Kai will just, you know, get tired, get a stomach ache, and decide to forfeit. That's also one way Sonora Silva That's could That's not move nice. Through. We don't want to wish illness I upon people. I did not. I just said it was a possibility. Sure. I'm not so are aliens. But let's let's see what happens here. Big rally there. There's a little bit of an overswing for Kai. S seen a few of those. Um, Big, deep rallies end with Kai uh, having an error as he shifts far out to the right, taking a forehand. A little soft shot there sets up another strong one afterwards. Missed time that one. Um, I think a lot of a lot of times with players like this that take big swings, um, you'll see if they overdo it, you might see some sort of discomfort or soreness in the triceps. If you're overdoing it a bit, so hopefully he can stay. He can stay in it. That was a bullet of a backhand. Good golly, gum drops. They've got it on replay. Oh, this is some insane backhands from just from Silva. Wow, 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 wow. I don't know where that came from, but he's got. If he can keep doing that. That's one of the uh, frustrating things about being over at this uh, commentating desk. I want to clap very badly for some of these points, but I don't want to blow up the ears of our spectators. I think we appreciate that. Thank you. What a nice serve there. Silva was not ready for it. No, he was a little early on that one. Sonura Silva's first year in NCTTA, whereas this is Kai Zhang's last year, a senior business major. Not sure what happened, but you know, when you serve that serve from the backhand side, you're not setting yourself up to push. So that was not the plan. So I think okay. that was a, a good receive from Kai. A little rushed on that one. He took it a little too quick off the bounce and it goes flying. There was nobody home if he made it though. Yeah, so it may just have been that he really wanted it and then overdid it just a touch. Rookie mistake. Ouch. Love that inside out forehand. He's been executing it very well this match. Overcooked that one a little bit. Just a little. So while we're on a tallow break here, just want to shout out again to my camera crew. They do amazing work. And if you're interested in joining the team, email us. Volunteers are what makes the dream work. And we're back. A little bit of a miss hit there, but he'll take it. As fun as it is to dance on camera, every time we do it, they just 
play a good point, and then we look like fools not showing it. But that's what the replays are for. Wow. Unforced error there ties it up for Kai. And Silva's already used his timeout, so he's just going to have to gut it out from here. Zoinks. I think he was a little quick on that one. Um, and you'll see that his, his backhand's got that sort of inside out, you know, fan kind of motion. And that ball was just too quick for him. Ooh, that was a I do not care shot. He had one of those yesterday. It made it into the highlights reel at the banquet. And they are a crowd pleaser. Jan Ove Wal Waldner style, just walk off the court. Good night. Mic drop. Exactly. <laughs> Not facing Kai though. Straight yeah, back to that's, work. That's the disadvantage of serving that from there. Uh, serving that serve from the forehand corner it leaves your backhand completely vulnerable. Um, Kai able to make him pay for that. Nice serve, though, to tie it back up. Sonora Silva making Kai earn this third game. Yeah, Kai definitely uh, got caught by surprise there. It was late on that. Kai actually started his NCTTA career at Binghamton University in the upstate New York Central Division. I really enjoyed having him and was heartbroken when he left but I'll still cheer for him. From the stands, of course, not from here. He gets golf claps from here. So game point for Silva here and a little bit of a lucky break, but he'll take it. And we have Deuce in this game three. Getting interesting. Not that it wasn't already. He looked like he was trying to do a little bit too much on that receive. Now that was interesting. It almost seemed like Sonura knew he was going to miss that shot before he took it. Maybe just feeling a tweak in the shoulder, indicating to him that he didn't get his footwork perfectly right. Right, definitely mistimed it. Match point here for Kai. And there you go. 3-0 uh, for Kai Zong. 11, 9, 14, 12, 12, 10. Chole, Kai, we will see you in the semis.